All right. I have Justin Blackman on the line for this uh, special episode of Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. Justin, we're going to just dive right in. What is the single most important thing that every copywriter and marketer should know about using a distinct voice and personality in their marketing, whether they're writing for a client or writing for their own business? Uh, I'm going to use a quote from Ellen DeGeneres to start on that one. Always be who you are unless you're a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> These are the proven direct response marketing, copywriting, and entrepreneurship success strategies you can use today to write your own ticket and create the life you want. I am Roy Furr, and this is Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. Now, here's today's breakthrough. Uh, but no, really, the, the, fact that, the fact is, everyone's going to have something that's a little bit different about them. And when you study the copywriting breast principles, you learn to follow them and you learn to write by the book. Um, and to throw another quote, I'm going to drop a lot of names here. Um, Neil Gaiman has a quote that I absolutely love. And he says, style is the stuff that you get wrong. And okay. the, the depth of that is basically saying that when you do start to add in a little bit of your personality and you do learn to break a couple of rules with intention and when you can justify it because it, it reflects who you are, that's when you begin to develop your personality and begin to stand out. So you don't just sound like every other single writer out there. So, so much, so much good to unpack in there. We'll, we'll dive into that throughout the course of this episode. So uh, now for the formal introduction here, uh, Justin Blackman, he spent two decades marketing big name brands like Red Bull, Puma, Five Hour Energy. There seems to be a, a consistency there. Um, <laughs> where he spoke to thousands of consumers and learned the power of good messaging. He went on to study quick hit storytelling techniques from comedians and then took up copywriting where he wrote 100 headlines every day for 100 brands over 100 days just for the fun of it. There had to have been some learning involved there too. But oh, yeah. uh, So Justin, Justin went on to work for a major travel brand where he wrote for up to 14 different hotels at the same time. Jeez. Then took those skills to an agency where he wrote long form Facebook ads and emails for 329 different people in 18 months. Justin learned how to apply comedy and conversion techniques for those of you in Break the Marketing Secrets, you know, that that's part of why I have him here uh, to stand out in people's news feeds and how and now specializes in creating voice guides for small businesses and personal brands. And he teaches people how to add personality to their writing so they sound a little less Ross and a little more Joey. Uh, all and all the people say he's pretty fly for a right guy, which is the uh, brand reference that we'll get into, I'm sure at some point. So Justin, Justin, hi, number one, thank you. Thank you for being on here. And um, I found you through an A-list copywriter, Kim Schwalm, who I respect a ton. And I was like, I have to talk to this guy. So thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm looking forward to all of this stuff. And, you know, Kim is a, is a great friend and I'm happy that I could uh, ride her coattails. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So uh, high level, what's what's the advantage of like personality driven marketing and building a personality driven brand? Well, if you're watching this, it's you'll see right away that I've got Super Grover on my shoulder. Yeah, right away. And it's amazing how much that comes up. And before we even start recording, we were talking about Super Grover. It just sort of gives a human element to everything. And I mean, I could have started off by like you read my my bio. You you've seen the work that I've done. There's a lot there, but the fact is, the Super Grover is going to make me more interesting. It becomes a common denominator that we have in common. We were talking about Star Wars because I've got stuff there. It makes me memorable. And a lot of times, when people are like, do you know Justin? Like, is that the guy with Super Grover? Like, yes. <laughs> so it becomes it it shows who you are more than what you've done or what you can do. And that's important, but obviously you do want to be able to deliver on everything, but being memorable and having that little hook that stands out, whether it is a visual trait or a, a copywriting trait or a, some type of skill or a personality trait will make you more memorable in, in people's eyes. Uh, for To use a direct response uh, classic example, you've got the guy in the Hathaway shirt um, with yes. the eye patch. If he wasn't wearing an eye patch, you wouldn't remember the ad. I guarantee most yeah. people have no idea what the copy says on that. He's got an eye so, patch. <laughs> so the 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 um 
there's there's that old lesson of if somebody has to know I can trust you before they buy from you. And so everything else being equal, if they like know what you can do and they trust that you can do it, it's these little aspects of likability, I would imagine that are, well, I know from experience that are contributing and, and it's, it's like, what can I grab onto? It's yeah. It, yeah. It, it um, fast tracks the like factor. It just gives you something to talk about. That's usually not work related that will um, just build up trust as you as a person. Uh, which then carries over and you kind of get the halo effect and it it carries into your skills too. Yes, excellent. So um, like I, I sticking with the high level questions for just a minute here, we, we we talk about personality and people, I guess, have a general sense of personality, but then there's also this whole like brand voice thing, voice guides that you do. So what's the what's the relationship? and difference between brand voice and brand personality? And, and what do those two terms mean as we're going to use them throughout this episode? Sure. Well, brand voice refers to sort of your overall, um, sorry, brand personality is more about your overall being, the sense of, of who you are. Brand okay. voice is just the way that that's conveyed through verbal dialogue. Um, like people say, what's your brand voice? Oh, we're professional and we're casual. That's a personality. A brand okay. voice is something more about um, giddy, cheerful, optimistic, um, you know, uh, verbose. Um, they're ways of defining the words uh, as rather than defining the person. It's way more granular when we're talking about brand voice and it becomes uh, less generic. Those are the differentiators that really affect the, the specific words that you're going to use. Um, like my brand voice is rhythmic. I have a short choppy cadence. It's, it's, it's staccato. I'm very careful about the way it sounds. That's not my personality. It's my voice. Okay. So That's interesting. Things. Yeah. Those are the things that brand guides get wrong where they say like, well, you know, what's your brand voice? Oh, we're professional. We're casual. We're, we're friendly. It's like the, the, the trifecta of nothingness. That's in like every brand voice guide I've ever read. It's not a <laughs> voice. That's a personality. Yeah. And so, so yeah. Well, th this is um, this is fascinating. I definitely want to get into, um, and this is not one of the questions that you sent me ahead of time. It's like, hey, this would be a great question to ask, but um, I I I want to get into kind of the measurements of brand voice um, soon because you you do really have this. Um, uh, when I saw you looking at brand voice, it is. It was something that I hadn't seen before as far as the granular understanding of that. But at but like zooming back to that higher level before we get into that, um, is there a general set of is there a general what I, I, I'm, I'm going for like a, a set of rules or guidelines that you having studied conversion is very different than somebody that says, I want to look professional. And so we, our brand, we talk about our 80 years in business and all of this highfalutin um, credibility stuff, but you have a focus on a specific type of voice with a conversion awareness, right? Yes. Um, and so in the context of this voice that that's that's likable, that is um, focused on generating results, um, I have questions that are coming up around like you know uh, writing like you talk and um, and and simple language like you talked about the rhythm rhythmic language the the simplicity the the readability how are those how do those contribute to a uh, marketing voice that people will respond to? Well, so there's a long question. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot there. The first one I'll do is uh, the first thing I'll address is write like you talk. Okay. The fact is most people don't talk as well as they think they do. Um, when I talk, you're going to get a lot of ums and ahs. Uh, you're going to get my awful first draft. It's in writing that I edit. My, my, my writing is clean. It's tight. I focus on word economy. I eliminate unnecessary words. I, to quote David Garfinkel, I de thatinize my copy or I remove the, the that's uh, in my copy. When I'm speaking, you're going to get that. It's going to be messy. Um, it's when I write, there are a lot of elements in that. Like I write gonna, 
Um, and there are times that I actually will type um and ah, like to, to the delay. That's my ellipses. Yes. But there, there are ways that you can transfer this stuff and it doesn't necessarily apply to everyone. If you're trying to look more professional and uptight, you're going to eliminate that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the person who uh, is professional speaks clearly. Sometimes you're getting their crappy first draft too when they speak. So you've yes. got, you got to know what to look for. Uh, also, when I speak, I have a lot more words per sentence. My, I've actually measured this stuff before. Writing my average sentence length is eight to 11 words. I write short. Okay. I write choppy. I have way more periods than commas. It's very deliberate with my style. When I speak, I ramble. <laughs> you're going to get long, glowy sentences. And if you're looking at a transcript of, my, of, of this conversation, that dialogue is going to be way more, uh, way longer than my typing. Okay. So, so th this whole idea of writing conversationally, if we're, if we're trying to put our personality into writing, it, it really isn't writing like an actual conversation. It's, it's writing like the perfect conversation in dialogue in a well-edited you know, story or whatever. Yes. Yes. Okay. So there, but it's funny, like if you look at some screenwriting, uh, Aaron Sorkin is one of my all time favorite writers. Uh, West Wing, love that show. The dialogue was impeccable. Um, if you look at it, almost nobody speaks that way. Most people don't write that way, but that's what made it so interesting. It made it beautiful. Uh, one of the other shows that I that I love, uh, well, the fav favorite writers, Amy Sherman Palladino, who does the marvelous Miss Maisel and did the Gilmore Girls. Okay. She had the characters write, talk like she writes. She writes like I do. It's short, it's choppy. Uh, the average script for a 30 minute show will be about 30, 30 pages. Her scripts were 60 pages. Everything was short, everything was choppy, everything was a new line. So the, the scripts got longer and it had this very fast paced rhythm that is back and forth that was smart and witty and clever. And the same thing with um, Marvelous Miss Maisel, which is all about a Borscht Belt comic. And the fact is, Amy Sherman Palladino's father was a Borscht Belt comic. So that style, that clean word economy, tight writing flowed into her style. And she's actually working it backward into dialogue. Interesting. Huh? So that's like the, that's the, that's the style thing. And I know, or not as a copywriter, as a, as somebody who's been paid a lot of money to write at various times, I'm not very good at using the words to describe writing as an English teacher would. And yeah. maybe because you've made that more of your business, you're much better at this than me. <laughs> and so forgive me if I uh, trash the vocabulary or uh, Go ahead. not uh, if I misrepresent the vocabulary. Um, but that's, that's kind of the writing cadence, the the, the writing um, structure. Yeah. What about when we are getting into the content of the writing and we're trying to establish maybe less a, a the likable marketing voice and more of like the likable personality? Is there, um, I mean, you you talked about you 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 need to be different. Um, no, you need to be yourself unless you're a ser serial killer, right? <laughs> um, so how does that fit in, under like different and having more personality? Um, is is different better than good? Uh, in the context of establishing this this voice and personality, uh, I've got some beef with the phrase "different is better than good." I believe okay. some of that uh, to uh, to an effect, but I've also seen a lot of things that are different and bad. So you need yes. to be different and good. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> I think that too many people focus on the being different part, and um, they rely on that. And I've I've seen a lot of very awful different and bad things. So. Um, but I think where the per personality comes in is like right there when you were kind of struggling for a minute to figure out how to talk about the vocabulary, you yes. said, I don't want to trash. Then you went, no, I don't want to, I don't want to misrepresent. I actually would have like, if it were me, I would have said, I don't want to trash it. So <laughs> it's that, that different level of vocabulary that is that more colloquial or is it more professional sounding? And there's the fact is like the reason why I, I, I picked up on that for a second is because when you say trash, there's 
there's so much more that you can do with that. You can actually make the whole thing thematic. We could talk about writing like garbage or sloppy writing or uh, toss it in the can or um, you know, make it a roommate with Oscar the Grouch. Like there's, you can go down this whole rabbit hole or trash can when you pick up a more interesting colloquial word rather than this highfalutin uh, vocabulary that sounds smart, but kind of puts you in a corner sometimes. Yeah, and I'll admit that um, the personality that I've kind of embraced for the way that I end up teaching marketing and copywriting, I do think of it as like a, a mostly kind and loving teacher. So the teacher at some point, the kind and loving teacher, is is going to be the person who who at some point does have to get the classroom under control, right? Yes. And so I can also be stern sometimes, but mostly it's it's I'm here and I'm presenting from. I, I guess I am, I'm acknowledging my own predisposition to have a little bit of an academic type of, uh, of language choice and sentence structure and all of that. Yeah. Um, but, but also kind, compassionate and all of that. Um, and, and so, yeah, maybe I do throw out words like trash and then, and then try and pull them back a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like you just said that you're the kind and loving teacher. I'm just thinking about some of my favorite teachers that I had in high school or even elementary school. And then there's that moment that shatters your world when you're uh, at the grocery store with your mom and you see your teacher there. And all of a sudden they're yeah. a real person. And yes. you're like, whoa, I didn't know that she ever left the classroom. <laughs> I tried to write a little bit more to the person when they're not in their job and yeah. respect that a little bit more and treat them uh, right to the way that they would be outside of the business setting uh, and factor a little bit of that in to make them feel more human rather than just the title. Okay, fair enough. Um, so, so I blew your mind a little bit. I blew your mind a little bit. Yeah. It, it definitely is something where where I know that I naturally resonate with the with copy um, that is written where where there is there is some layer of personality in there. I mean, I've studied all the classic. I've studied Ogilvy. I've studied uh, Cables. I've studied Schwab. I've studied you know how to write mm -hmm. a good advertisement, right? But if yeah. everybody writes like that, there's no personality in it because it's all the uh, copy copywriter's personality, right? And I, I do notice that when copywriters are starting up, one of the biggest complaints that I have for them is um, basically that you write like a copywriter. <laughs> um, and, and that is a thing. Like if you, if you just try to emulate all the top copywriters and I, I had one project I got in trouble in uh, on very early on in my career where I tried to write a John Carlton headline mm -hmm. and the client saw right through it. And he's like, you're not John Carlton. So write, write Roy's headline. Yeah. <laughs> they learn from that. Right. Yeah. It, but that's important because now there are people that want to write like Roy. Yes. And you become a combination in this like weird, messy conglomeration of everything that you picked up. And yeah. that's really where your personality comes in. Like, you'll know that that like, oh, I'm actually taking this from, from Carlton and I'm actually dropping in a little bit of Schwab and a little bit of Ogilvy here. And then I'm actually going to tighten yeah. up like Hemingway. You know that you're doing that. The yes. reader just sees a great headline. Yes. And they then start to write like you, uh, sort of indiscriminately picking these things up along the way. And you're writing with intent um, because you've gone beyond intuition. And that I think is the switch that that flips at 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 a certain point. So a, a little a little bit of a tangent here from anything that I plan to talk about. But, um, <laughs> when when I was in high school, I used to break dance, and it was you know we we would meet up at the bottom of one of the staircases in the school, and it was during lunchtime, and we would just break dance. And one of the guys there was such a good rapper like he was yeah. just an incredible MC and at one point I asked him like how did you get so good at that and he said that he basically he everybody who he liked he memorized enough of their stuff until he felt like he could rap like them yep. but he said you do that with one and the next and the next and the next and the next and then suddenly when you actually go to create your own stuff 
you are pulling from one and the next and the next and the next. And yeah. then that is you. And it's your unique. And I'm I'm probably laying layering in more description here than he did, but it's that it's your unique interest in choosing, you know, A, B, C, D, and yeah. X, Y, and Z that makes your style unique and different than everybody else. And that seems to be relevant to what you just said, but I don't have a question off of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> But no, I mean, that's all part of it. I remember seeing John Carlton speak at uh, Copy Chief Live a couple of years ago, and he was talking about one of the lines in his, uh, in I don't remember what it is. I think it was for golf. Uh, so he's yeah. talking about how to hit a long drive. And it says, sometimes we can't hit straight and we don't, not, we, we don't know why, we just don't know why. And that line right there, we don't know why, we just don't know why, it was uh, taken from... Um, Simon and Garfunkel's The Only Living Boy in New York, which he had on in the background. And you're not going to know that reading it, but those little things that pepper into the copy and just sort of are there because you like it, kind of make it great. And that's what makes it interesting. Yeah, that's awesome. So here, here's one thing that I've run into and you you being a somebody who specializes in, in helping brands develop voice guides uh, may have something to say about this. As a freelancer, I think one of the reasons that early on in our career, we default to, we're going to write just like the ad books say to write, mm -hmm. is we're kind of afraid of encouraging clients to go after a strong voice and strong personality in the writing, especially if it's like project-based work versus I've been working for this company for three years or something yeah. like that, right? So like, do you have any recommendations for people who write for clients who are maybe on a first and second project, first or second project? How do you get the client to buy into your choice of stronger voice and stronger personality in marketing? It's got to be a case by case basis. There were definitely people early in my career that hired me because they liked my website and because I thought it was fun and silly and they wanted some of that in their copy. So I wrote like me for them and they're like, oh, this is great, but we can't use this. And they were right. I was like, I gave them what they asked for, but it's not really what they wanted. Um, there are certain, I couldn't convince them to be funny if okay. or to have more personality. If your client is more conservative and more like, we don't care about the brand voice, we just want to get this to convert, it's probably actually not the time to focus on personality. There's a time and a place for it. Um, that's when I would focus more on the voice rather than the personality about trying to get it straight and get it to match their style, their writing style. But you can actually strip out personality pretty easily. So you can still have a great piece. Um, essentially, you don't want to have a, a bad piece with a lot of personality. You want to have a great piece with personality. And if the personality doesn't fit, you can move it out and you'll still have a great piece. I think yes. that's, where, that's where the levels are there. So it's important to understand those conversion elements first. Like first and foremost, leave with that. Yeah. So, so like, um, there's, a, there's an old lesson I got from Gary Ben Savenga that he would often, when he got work with a new client, uh, one of the ways that he consistently beat the control in these super high competitive situations is he would, he would write one version of the promo that was explicitly, we're going to follow the rules as much as possible here mm -hmm. and try and beat the control by following the rules. And then he would write a second version that is, I'm going to just give myself permission to do something creative here. Yeah. And he said, he said, usually, usually between those two, it was the one that followed the rules that, that would win. Yeah. But it would always like when it won, it was like, it would beat the control by, you know, 20% or something that made it worth it for the client, but was also not super impressive. Yeah. But when it was the personality driven one, when that one worked, like when the one where he took more creative risks worked, yeah. it, that one was the one where it doubled the response rate of the control and, you know, was, was a huge winner. Yeah. Um, so tied to, tied to all of this, one thing that I've experienced and I want, I want to give you an opportunity to reflect on it is one of the ways that I've picked up when I've had a client say, oh, you nail my voice or you nail my personality in this writing. Yeah. Most often what I have done is I listened to them and their stories specifically, yeah. and I told their stories yeah. just clearly. Yeah. Um, so how does how do you use storytelling as a tool in the context of brand voice and personality and personality-driven marketing? 
So there's a couple of different ways, and I'm just starting to get into this. I, I make no claims to be a master storyteller. I get some <laughs> feedback saying that I'm pretty good at it and that I've taught some people some good things, but I don't claim to be a master storyteller. Um, there's one of the things that I noticed back when I was writing a lot of those long form Facebook ads was I could tell stories about anything and make it sound on brand. Um, I remember they were talking about like tools that didn't work. And I told the story about um, crosswalks in New York City and the push to cross button. They don't work. They're disconnected. But people okay. think that they work. And it's yeah. because they upgraded the traffic lights. Everything's got sensors. But it costs a lot of money to remove the button. So they just left them there disconnected. They don't work. It's a good story. It's a great hook. I've actually used it a couple of times. It works really, really well. Anyone yes. can tell that story. The fact that I can use it across multiple clients means it's a good story, but it does, means it's also not a great story. It's the personal stories when, like, if you were you were talking about you breakdancing in, in the hall and yeah. you're a buddy that, that I can't tell that story unless I know to ask you. Um, those are the really interesting ones. That's where we need to try to figure out how to get those stories from our clients before we go ahead and write the generic one. And that's actually something that I've been working on with uh, with a couple of different clients and, and even some copywriters that I've been coaching. Is trying to figure out a way to get those stories before you write something and you show it to the client and they're like, oh, that reminds me of this story. And then you got to go back and rewrite the whole thing. Um, yeah. you will using, using Carlton as an example, cause we've already talked about him. He has that very famous one-legged golfer ad that yeah. ran forever. Right. And the way that he described it was sales detective work. So, uh, he was talking to this, this guy and he's talking about this balance, like this balance trick that he has for his drives and all of that stuff and explaining it spent like 90 minutes or close to two hours on the phone with this guy or talking to him in person. And like, that's how John described it. Like just this long, long conversation. And then he just asked the right question. He said, yeah. so like, where did you first see this? Or like, like get the first, get the idea for this in the first place. And the guy's like, oh, well, it was this crazy thing. So we were golfing and the group ahead of us, there was this guy that was, he was like one leg, he, he was missing yeah. a leg. Yeah. And so he, he, you know, he took his crutches up to the hole, but then dropped them and, you know, stood with his driver and we just watched how he on one leg and John's like the, the, you know, the alarm bells are going off and saying like, there's so much personality in the story, but at the same time, like the client did not know to say that. So it is right. sales detective work, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the truth behind the stories are often better than the stories that we know. Like, yes, even just do it. The whole Nike tagline, the Wade and Kennedy, you know, super popular. Everyone knows that. The story behind that tagline was that it was the last words of a serial killer before the execution, <laughs> which is great. It's a tagline yeah. built by a murderer. Like I said, with Ellen, <laughs> anything yeah. you want, unless you're, unless you're a serial killer, well, apparently you can write a really good tagline if you're a serial killer. Yeah. But that was the, the, they said, do you have any last words? And he said, just do it. And yeah. that's it. That's And some copywriter that writes it down and says, all yeah. right. It was like 20 years later that he was thinking of a line. And he's like, just do it. And then that's where it came from. Yeah. I find that story more exciting than the, you know, just the, the way that, it's, <laughs> that it is now. Yes. So I, I, I want to pivot at this at this point. Um, my, my notes here, the category for these next questions is the scientific approach to developing an interesting personality, which is probably <laughs> not actually, you know, the, 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 exactly what we're going to cover here. Um, but recently I got an article from you and I don't know if it's something you just wrote or it was a video, actually. I don't know if it's a video you just made or something in your, you know, welcome sequence, Yeah. but you, you did this brand voice analysis and I saw you using these different tools to analyze yep. tone and feel a voice. And what you explained in there was, okay, you can have two almost identical offers right? Yes. But they're made to feel very different by actually measurable components yeah. of voice. So how do you, whether you're doing it for yourself or for a client, how do you measure writing voice? And then how do you make decisions around choosing writing voices? 
Sure. So voice, to begin with, we actually have to define into three measurable components. Those okay. components are vocabulary. So the, the level of words that you use, if you use Hemingway app, you'll be familiar with that. Like yes. first uh, uh, postgraduate. So there's the level of your vocabulary, the words that you choose. Then there's the cadence, which is the rhythm of your writing. Like I mentioned that I, I write short and choppy. Other people write long, flowy, wordy bird sentences that go on and on forever. And you seem to run out of breath before you even reach the end of it. And your eyes get so dry because you haven't blinked yet. And you have yet to, to even hit a semicolon or a comma or an exclamation point. That's, that's the cadence, <laughs> long yes. versus, versus short. And then you've got the tones, which are the emotions underneath it. You can have happy, um, joyful, uh, confident, tentative, using words like just, maybe some. And I, we don't just want to get to joyful, but we can, I mean, I could say calm. Like if, if I describe someone as happy, that could mean calm and serene, like just a peaceful happiness, or it could mean sprightly and bouncing off the walls. So there are all these different levels in between. So we actually want to measure, you can use like an emotion wheel to figure out exactly where you're falling. To... That's funny. I, I glanced over here where I actually have an emotion wheel on my wall. Yeah, um, I, have so, a, yeah. I have a pillow of one. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got one on my desktop and I, I have it open all the time. This is how we identify the tones. So it's okay. vocabulary, tone, and cadence. Now I have my own framework to play with it, which is words, tone, and frequency, which is WTF. So WTF is your voice. That's me playing with vocabulary, yes. which gives it a whole different feel. Um, so there's the WTF of voice. But by playing with those, you can actually figure out how to turn the dials of each element of the voice to make it sound different. And that can make us sound, we change up the vocabulary to, to like postgraduate, it makes us sound authoritative. If we turn that down and make the sentences short and choppy, it makes us sound bouncy. It makes us sound punchy, uh, bright, cheerful. Um, lots of those different elements. And you can really twist those dials any way to come up with any unique combination. And you can also figure out your client's style to match it. Yeah. And this way, if they say like something's off here, you're going to know it's either the, the vocabulary, the tone, or the cadence, and you're going to know exactly what to fix. Okay. Um, so how do, how does that turn from, from, um, descriptive to prescriptive? How does it turn from, okay, I'm, I'm looking at, um, I, I, I take a piece of writing that I did and I analyze it mm -hmm. into, if this is my favorite piece of writing that I've done, how do I write more like it? Or if I feel like this is the piece of writing that most represents my personality, how do I write more like that? Um, or this is the client, this is the piece of, of copy that the client says, this is like really what we're looking for in terms of style and feel. How do I, as a new copywriter, that's not the guy that wrote the original one or the gal that wrote the original one, how do I replicate that? It's it's the same process either way. You can either um, break down a, a a project to see like measure the vocabulary, tone, and cadence to figure out what's there uh, beneath the surface. Or if they're like, well, our writing is a little boring. We wish that it sounded more like this. You can change the direction to make it sound like more of that other piece because you're gonna know the differences between each level. Um, like if they want it to sound a little bit more flowery. Maybe that's just changing the cadence. Maybe that's giving it a softer tone. Maybe that's uh, elevating vocabulary a little bit. It's measuring those things so you can dial in the voice very specifically to, uh, to figure out exactly where, like you can actually plot this on a graph and you can figure out where they fall versus where you are and adjust it. So it can really go either way. You can move towards something or you can know exactly what your plot point is and try to make everything sound uh, near that spot. Okay. So you, you, one last question in the, in this context of scientific approach to developing an interesting personality. Um, you, you mentioned Hemingway as a tool that you use. Uh, is, are there other specific tools free or paid that, that you are using? Cause I think I saw one that was about, um, that was more about the tone and less about, for example, uh, flesh Kincaid readability level. Sure. Yeah, uh, IBM Watson has a tone analyzer that you can use. Uh, there's uh, one called Textalyzer, which will tell you the sentiment of your voice, uh, which is really more for SEO. There's a few different tools, but the IBM Watson one is the one that I primarily use for tone. Um, I will have to, I, I do have to 
put the caveat on that, that the tone one is the most algorithmic of the tools where if you're going to be like, um, wow, this makes me mad. It's going to show that you're angry. Um, or like, I'm mad at how much I love this. They're still going to show that as angry because it's just based off of specific words that trigger something. A lot of this, you have to put on your, use some copywriting skills and sensibilities here to dial in your, your intuition, but I'll, that, well, dial in your intuition, but put a process behind it with things like the emotion wheels to figure out the very specific level that the client wants to reach. Okay. So if it says, oh, this client writes, um, <laughs> this client writes angry copy all the time. And it turns out that the client just uses the, so I, I started bugging my oldest son when he started using slang all the time from school. And so I came up with my own slang and I actually got his friends at school to use it for a day oh. to just completely drive him nuts. And oh, the specific that slang that I use, <laughs> the specific <laughs> slang was mad clap. Like that's mad clap. And it's yeah. what, it, <laughs> and it's supposed to be a good thing. Right. But it's like saying bad is good, whatever, but yeah. mad clap. But if the client always says like, Oh, that's mad clap, but this happened. Right. Yeah. And suddenly IBM Watson is like this, this, this client has some anger issues. You're like, no, they don't. Right. <laughs> it's either that or they have the clap, either one. So. <laughs> <laughs> Moving <Yeah>. on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm big with awkward pauses. <laughs> yes, yes. Part of my um, brand. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you, so in the context of, of, I guess, after you've measured it, you do kind of prescriptive brand voice guides and recommendations. Um, so how much of that, like, like it brings up a bunch of questions, like, oh, my voice is intuitive. And if it's, if it's me, maybe my voice is intuitive. That's one of the reasons that I have learned to write for myself very prolifically is because I've just kind of accepted that my voice is my voice or embrace my voice or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. So but is voice trying to copy voice of other people or trying to say, oh, Justin, here's how you write. Can you repeat that? Is that like an intuitive process or? It is to a certain point. Uh, you are well beyond the point where I think that a writer would be able to emulate you intuitively because you are aware of your influences. Uh, you're going to know, well, I really line based off of this line and it's a, kind of a, a conglomeration. The writer is not going to know that. But what they can do is measure your average words per sentence and measure the vocabulary level and get pretty close to it and use their copywriting sensibilities to write something that sounds like it um, and then dialing in those right tones and emotions to get it similar. Uh, I mean, I've written, I've written voice guides for you know, Todd Herman. Uh, I've written for Bobby Klink, um, um, Amy Porterfield, a lot of people who have books. And they also use writers. And some writers have tried to do it by instinct and write intuitively by uh, just looking at the copy and, and mirroring it. Some people have nailed it. Some people, some great writers have missed the mark entirely. Okay. By putting the process and using the math, you're going to get pretty damn close on the first try. Yeah. And it would certainly allow you, I mean, if I were, if I were to realize that me trying to write like Justin um, I realized that Justin averages nine words per sentence and my first draft is 11 words per sentence, then I have more of a direction of how to get a little bit closer in yes. editing. I'd say, oh, wait, he uses some shorter stuff, some choppier stuff. I yeah. better, I better edit to make it more choppy. Yeah. Um, I, but like nine to 11 is not bad. It's when it, it goes from nine to 36 <laughs> that it's off. Yes, and yes. the fact is, I actually do, I tend to end on a very long sentence and then have a super short one right after it. So like I make you lean in when I reiterate the whole message and dial in the point. So you're, you're listening and you're paying attention. Then I'm going to give you the punch. Yes. So I do have patterns with my cadence for when I break it and it's deliberate. It's when I, it, even those little things, the sentence length, whenever a, a a client will say, there's something about this sentence that's off and I don't know what it is. It's usually that cadence. It feels off. Um, but by knowing what to look for, you can dial it in. And sometimes just splitting it, changing a comma to a period is enough to make it seem on brand. So it's those yes. little. It, it, there's a dynamics that's created in any writing style that 
um, can be it can be hard to emulate. But so so that leads into the next question. If 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 you give me a voice guide, right? Mm-hmm. Let's say I don't know. You mentioned Amy Porterfield. Um, I'm a I'm a new ghostwriter for Amy Porterfield, and you've given me the Amy Porterfield or her team or whoever has yeah. given me this voice guide. Doesn't that just like stifle my creativity for being able to write? Um, you know, maybe I'm trying to capture some of the ideas that she talks about. Isn't it going to be a lot harder to try and write in the creative constraints of a voice guide? It's going to be a lot harder to write wrong. It does stifle your creativity, but it channels it in the right direction. The only thing it stops you from doing is going down the wrong path. So that is a common thing. Like people see it. My voice guides are often 97, 123 pages long. And someone's like, oh my God, how am I supposed to write? I'm like exactly like this. You can't do it wrong. If you follow these rules, you're going to get it right. It's yeah. like bumpers on a bowling lane. It just knocks you. It prevents you from getting a gutter ball and it gets you closer to being able to bowl a strike. Awesome. I, th- I think that that's one of those things. I have another project kind of unrelated to voice where I'm having to create just a project plan, right? And mm-hmm. I know that spending a ton more time up front creating the project plan is going to save a lot of time on the back end with edits and, um, you know, confusion and yeah. all of that stuff. And so, for example, if I'm writing, you know, the next Amy Porterfield book or uh, Ramit Sethi's another another guy who I understand yep. is very hard to write for in the beginning yes. because he, he has like his landing pages are just long and just full of so much, just yes. so much um, that if you approach it like, oh, I'm just going to crank out a landing page, it is not going to, it's not going to work yeah. at all. Right. Um, but if you take that time to learn it, like I know people who've written for Ramit and they say, once you take the time to learn it, it's, it's actually really fun and interesting and compelling to write. Yes. It's funny that you bring him up because the process that I teach and I, I teach it with her, it was created by Abby Woodcock. And yes. she was, she wrote the voice guide for Ramit Sethi. And it all started when she was on, she was basically began by having to write uh, tweetables for all of his blog posts. So she had to learn his style, went through everything and was documenting these elements of vocabulary, tone and cadence. And he said to her, how come you can get my voice so quickly when no, no other writer can grasp it like you? She's like, oh, well, I'm using this process. And she's like, can you, can, can you teach this to other people? And she became the, the copy chief. She put together the, 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 the style guide for Ramit. And that's the program that we use. That's what I teach. That's where this, this came from. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, uh, that's a completely accidental uh, walking into yeah. that great example. Uh, excellent. Well, do you have, I, I suppose that that's a, that's a bridge to, do you have favorite brand voices? I mean, you work for uh, three brands that are about going fast, Red yeah. Bull, Five Hour Energy, and Puma. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you, you've, you've done lots of work with lots of entrepreneurs and, and brands. Um, do you have brands that just get you excited while you also know that they're generating results? So my favorite one right now is Liquid Death Mountain Water. Um, which looks like a beer can and has this like graphic, uh, almost violent type of brand to it, the style to it. But the fact is like the whole thing where they're like preaching death and blood, it's death to glass. It's death to plastic. It's because they sell water in a can and they're all very pro recycling. It's all about the good of the earth. Um, But it has this almost like beer alcohol type marketing behind it. Um, and it's super playful, but if you actually look at the the structure behind the page, their website, it's very deliberate. The brand voice gets bigger and bolder and grosser, I guess, um, <laughs> more ghoulish, the deeper you go down. But it's like liquid death mountain water and the tagline is relaxed, it's just water. Because they know the first thing that everyone asks is what the heck is this? And they're answering the question. They're playing into the stages of awareness. It is very deliberately written and it does follow the copywriting rules, but it it leads with personality, but the structure is always there. Yeah. I think that's how it works. There, there's an interesting thing that you mentioned as, uh, in terms of their personality coming out more 
as you get further in. Yeah. So it's not like they hide their person. It's it's in the name, right? Yeah. They don't hide their personality. But there is something to be said for that, that you're. Uh, so like I have I have this this uh, Buddhist painting up on my wall mm -hmm. um, and it's about um, stages of awareness. And it's based on the it's this elephant herder. Um, painting that has meaning every step along the way. Okay. And somebody actually saw just like a sliver of it, almost like you see right now. Yeah. Um, and, and he said he actually bought because of that, because as he went deeper, he was discovering more about my personality. And he actually knew, knew that painting better than I did. Um, but, but as people go deeper into your brand, maybe they find you because of some um, very logical, like I have a problem and this person, um, this person has a solution. Yeah. And so I'm interested in that. Right. But then I figure out, oh, this person's like me in this context. So like Perry Marshall, a friend and client of mine, one of the things that he talks about is he's a huge rush fan. Okay. Um, and he said that there was enough of an overlap that when Facebook targeting allowed you to be more stalkerish, he could do overlap between entrepreneur and rush fan yeah. and just had this insane targeting that worked, right? And you don't necessarily like, it's not super obvious that the AdWords guy is going to be, is going to be like rush, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I love that, that idea that the deeper someone goes, the more your personality can come out. Um, yeah. What's great about that, like rush. Uh, so Tom Sawyer, big number one, uh hit of theirs uh today's tom sawyer mean mean pride uh mean mean stride um you could actually write an ad today's copywriter mean mean stride and <laughs> like it's got the musicality of it it's got the personality and someone that's a rush fan would be like yeah all right and they're gonna want they're gonna be hooked they're gonna want to know what's what's there but you yes. still need to lead with the stage of awareness <laughs> and have copywriter in the front so they know who it's for awesome Yes. Well, there's, I, I feel like we are just scratching the surface, but also I have time constraints. So I want to yeah. make sure that we transition into, you have a few different things. So you mentioned the, the, the work that you've done with Abby Woodcock, um, which she's excellent too, and we're paying attention yeah. to. So I love that you two teamed up on that. Um, you have the work that I discovered through Kim Schwalm. Yeah. Um, and if somebody were to actually say, Oh geez, I need Justin's help. <laughs> um, there's you have a way to get a hold of you, and and you can help them with developing their their voice and personality in their marketing. So, yeah. can we point people towards? Of course, there's links in the description. I got to be a good YouTuber and podcaster and say there's links in the description to all of yeah. this. Um, but Justin, can you speak to some of the different ways that people can engage and why they might choose one path over another? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, everything I do is related to brand voice in some way. If you're a copywriter or an entrepreneur and you're looking to learn how to develop your own personality and put that into writing, then uh, I've got a program called Write More personality -er, which is a ridiculous name. Uh, but it's just about, uh, it's got 81 ways and joke techniques and conversion techniques that are sort of the lessons that the, the writers slip between the cracks, uh, that the things that they say between the lessons and like the good stuff that you can't Google. Um, that's in, that's in write more personality or, and that's at justinblackman.com. Okay. And then if you are a copywriter and looking to learn how to write in another client's voice, um, that's in write like anyone, which is write like anyone.com. And that teaches you the science of breaking down the voice so you can create it and mirror it. And that's the one that's with Abby Woodcock too. Yes. Um, and then, and then if, um, if somebody listening says, okay, I, for, for example, you know, I'll, I, I work with people who are maybe a, a marketing director at a company or CEO at a company. And they say, well, we're bringing on more copywriters. We're building a team. And it feels like every single copywriter is starting from scratch in terms of being able to write like us. I, I need somebody to help me define what our voice is. And I don't want to go through a course. I want to talk to Justin. Cool. Where do they go for that? That's at prettyflycopy.com, which is where the whole pretty fly for a right guy comes in. <laughs> Give it to me, baby. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you, you must you must be uh, yeah, teens or 20s in the 90s. 
to to have that reference. Yep. Gen X yeah. through and through. Yep. Yep. Um, clap, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, Justin, um, I, you know, I really appreciate you coming on and um, I love finding the stride and I love that just this discussion about personality brings out some different stories, et cetera, that wouldn't normally come out yeah. in, my, in my more structured content. So thank you for coming on and having this conversation with me. Yeah, it's been a blast. Excellent. And I look forward to uh, sharing this. I, I suppose that's the that's the off-camera thing that I should. Uh, I look forward to sharing this with my, with my audience. And for those of you who have just you know watched and listened to this episode, thank you for tuning in for this. And I'm, I hope that you got as much value from Justin as I did. And I think the one thing for me to walk away with is even even if you are fairly new in your career as a copywriter, like you have permission to have a more distinctive voice and have a little bit more personality in your copy. Don't make it a distraction, but you have permission to have more personality and to let your client's personality shine through and, um, and know that that can help drive actual conversion and business results. All right, uh, I guess, Justin, final thank you for being on Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. It's been a pleasure. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you once again for tuning in to this daily episode of Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. Remember, check out the links with this episode for even more value. Now make sure you like, comment, share, subscribe, and engage in every way you can to keep this show going and growing and delivering daily value to you. I'll catch you soon for your next big breakthrough.